Hello, everybody. Welcome to Casa Aid USA's third webinar in our mental health series. Thank you so much for being here with us today. We're very excited to have an incredible group of panelists for this much needed discussion on coping with stress and anxiety. Before introducing our panelists, I'd like to inform you of the setup for today's webinar. So please note that you will automatically be muted, your video switched off. And while this is the case, we would love to hear any thoughts, comments, or questions that you have. So please feel free to type these in the chat box at any time during the webinar. The last 15 minutes are reserved for a Q&A session and you will be able to view everybody's questions. You can vote for those you wish to be answered as well as add in your own anonymously if you prefer. And as time permits, the panelists will respond. So now for a quick disclaimer, during this conversation, we will be raising a lot of topics surrounding mental health, particularly anxiety. So please note that this webinar, webinar cannot substitute for and is not an alternative to therapy, diagnosis or treatment. Um, also note that you are not obligated to remain in this space. You can exit the webinar at any time that you please. And finally, we will be providing resources at the end as well. So now to introduce our panelists in no particular order, welcome Amrit Paul Bunsell, an MBACP psychotherapist trained in CBT and integrative counseling, who has worked with clients therapeutically for over 11 years, dealing with anxiety, depression, trauma, abuse, and bereavement. Next, please welcome Sunny Chopra, life coach, motivational speaker, human resources professional, and creator of the Sunny Success Stories podcast. Sunny helps individuals within the South Asian community conquer old school thinking and challenge various stigmas. Welcome Gloria Zhang, founder of the Inner Child podcast, a top 100 mental health show and registered psychotherapist whose work on anxiety, childhood trauma, and relationships have been featured on NBC and Toronto Star. From Calsa Aid USA, we have Gurit Deep Kaur, our Arizona state lead who is passionate about helping the community and as a junior in high school is aware of how overwhelming school can be and that many teens share this experience. Moderating the panel will be myself, Sasha Singh, a master of psychology student, um, community relations lead with Calsa Aid USA and a crisis counselor on the National Suicide Prevention Lifeline and for frontline workers through New Jersey Hope and Healing. Thank you all so much for being here with us today. And let's jump right into this conversation. So um, let's talk, start talking about perhaps what stress and anxiety mean to you in your personal and professional roles and what might some differences be um, between stress and anxiety and also some ways that they may relate. I can go first. Uh, at the top of my head, I would say stress. I, I guess you could do it in the personal sense, professional sense. It's something where you're thinking of a future event. You're thinking of an outcome that may or may not play out. And it's just something where it's it's going to motivate you to do something. And whether that's a good thing or a bad thing, it's going to depend on the context. You know, for example, um, you know, if you're practicing for a presentation and you're stressed out about that, that's probably good stress. But if it's stress of, will this person accept me? Will I be rejected? Um, you know, I don't, I don't think I can, I'm not happy with my life. Or like all those kind of things, that's a stress where it's a little more uh, difficult, generally speaking. And I say anxiety is just, it's a more amplified version of stress and it's more uh, flight or flight. I actually, to add on to that, actually, I agree with what Sunny is saying about it. It can be seen as a positive or a negative. I think if I look at it professionally from my work side, objectively, initially, you can well find it hard to distinguish between the differences, because from the outside, it can appear that they both lead to excessive worry and an ability to focus, feeling irritable. And I have had clients say they're experiencing sleepless nights and exhaustion. Even the physical symptoms experienced, such as your heart beating faster, headaches, stomach feeling unsettled, muscle tension, those experiences can affect both people experiencing stress and those in having an anxiety disorder or concern. The symptoms can seem interchangeable. Um, what I would have a say to add on to even funny thing is that with stress, it's a response to perceived threat in any given situation. It's a basically a reaction to a demand or a trigger that is placed on your mind or body. Whilst anxiety, I guess you could define it as a feeling of uneasiness, worry, or even fear. 
It can be diagnosed as an ongoing mental health concern that can be a reaction to a particular stressful event or triggered by various stresses in an individual's life. However, sometimes with anxiety, those stresses aren't initially identifiable. So for example, I can have people come to me saying that I don't know exactly what's causing it, but that feeling or that emotion can lead to difficulties in various occupational, social, or personal settings. I'm just gonna piggyback off of my panelists here. Thank you, Sasha, for the wonderful introduction. And I just wanna say that stress and anxiety can feel very uncomfortable, but um, from a mental health perspective, just as um, our fellow panelists said, they're nothing to be afraid of. These are very natural human emotions. And it's really just a way of your body letting you know that uh, something is not right or something is misaligned and um, that it's really important for us to honor and listen to those feelings, not as a bad thing, but it's actually a very good thing that your body is, is uh, telling you that something is off. Um, I feel everything is covered on what exactly stress and anxiety is. But going off them, it looks very like, you know, different in a school situation rather than, you know, profession rule. For example, for a school rule, it's like mostly based on testing and especially like for seniors applying for college. Hey, what are we going to apply to? Are we going to get in a resume forming all of those things? And like especially parents expectations add on a lot, especially if you belong to like, you know, the Indian community, they have a lot of expectations, not even just your parents expectations as well, your own expectations, if you can land on your own expectations and think, oh, yeah, can I do this? Can I make it? And that adds up. And for like, as well as for anxiety, I would say it's mostly like a lot of high school students do have social anxiety. So their seminars, um, it's hard for them to put, try to say what they're trying to say to like the in a group and express what they mean because it's just stressing them out and like it adds up just in that situation. They're not sure how to present themselves. They're not sure if they're going to say the right thing or the wrong thing. So I think that all adds up. Yes, thank you all. Um... Yeah, so you know that there are a lot of similarities. It sounds like what from what all you all of you have said between stress and anxiety, and sometimes you know they can be hard to distinguish. And oftentimes, when somebody is maybe you know suffering with anxiety or dealing with anxiety, often it can be brushed off as stress. But I do think that it's important to you know understand the difference between the two as well. So thank you all for those insights. So um, now kind of broadening out a little bit, I'd like to ask all of you, what does stress and anxiety look like among the, the different communities that you serve? I guess we can use the same order. Uh, I, I feel like, uh, especially, cause I, I do service the South Asian community in particular. Uh, I, I think uh, the, the way stress is, it's very, like 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 it was brought up that it's something that's a good thing it's something that we should be listening to i feel like in the south asian community it's something that's just brushed off and something you're told that hey it's okay you know use something temporary to fix it whether that be alcohol drugs uh whether that be you know distracting yourself uh working out like working out and doing things like that hanging out with friends those things are good but if it's not solving your problem at the end of the day then it's not going to really it's just like an endless cycle so i feel like in this that particular community Stress is not something that is dealt with properly. And to add to that, it could be taken out on others. You know, if I have someone stressing me out um, in the workplace, I might come home and take it out on my partner or my kids, right? So it's not something that has a lot of, of awareness, uh, unfortunately, within, within, this, within the community. I'll go up next, I think, because we are going in order, like Sunny said. Um, my work tends to be more with one-on-one -on -one clients and individuals in sessions. However, I can see that there are themes or patterns amongst clients. People have, which I think we'll get into more as well, they felt stress and anxiety over finances as work was significantly reduced in many sectors in the last year and a half. I have quite a few working professionals. Uh, the potential fear of loved ones or themselves getting ill as well as worry of hospitalization. I have seen, like I said, clients and people in general that I've worked with, even in the voluntary sector, 
feel anxious, but they don't know what is causing it. It's almost like what we refer to as generalized anxiety. That means having regular or uncontrollable worries about many different things in your everyday life. And because of those variety of symptoms that we've touched on, it can be a very broad diagnosis, which means that what you experience may look very different to somebody else's experience of anxiety. I think sometimes that can be very unsettling because we look left and right and we're like, oh, but what I'm feeling is so different to somebody else. And just to give some people an idea, it's not to overwhelm anybody, but in the spectrum of anxiety that I've seen, it can even include panic, uh, post-traumatic stress disorder, so PTSD to a certain event, it can include phobias or obsessive compulsive behavior. What I'm saying is that's where, you know, each person has a very unique and individual experience. And that's why it's so great we're having this conversation because each of us can add to that in these different sectors because it's just so unique. Thank you. So I specifically work uh, mostly with folks who are adults and who are looking to overcome traumas that they've experienced uh, when they were younger. So I do work with a lot of uh, folks in the BIPOC community. And I just want to say, first of all, that during this whole pandemic, I think all of us have experienced anxiety to some degree. And just kind of going off of today's theme is that there is for us to feel anxious about a worldwide pandemic is absolutely a normal response. All right, we are all navigating a brand new world together. We are all navigating something um, worldwide that we've never encountered before as a collective. And so, you know, in this sense, the anxiety makes a lot of make, makes a complete sense. Uh, you know, in to be completely honest, um, I also work with a specific kind of anxiety that comes from social anxiety. And the, the kind of anxiety that I work with is when someone feels like they're not allowed to be their real selves. And so they feel this uh, inconsistency between the kind of person that they are expected to be. And these are usually things that are picked up from childhood of that there are aspects of our personalities that we think are acceptable or unacceptable. And this kind of anxiety comes from putting on a performance or feeling like you have to perform as a perfect person or a well put, to put together person and have having to hide your authentic self. Um, and I would say that especially during COVID, this has also manifested because we are all struggling with trying to figure out um, what the normal reaction to things uh, really are, which of course the answer, um, you know, as my previous panelist just said, there is no right answer, right? That um, we, the expression of anxiety looks different for everyone. Um, going off Gloria is what um, I was gonna kind of go off on what a person is expected to be and they're not able to show their true self. And I feel everyone has a different way of showing stress and anxiety. Like for high schoolers, it can be shoe tapping, pencil tapping. Um, for social anxiety, a lot of people have trouble talking, so they, they just withdraw. They don't say anything. They don't know where they are. They basically freeze. So as Gloria said, there's no right or wrong answer. Everyone has a different way to express their own stress and anxiety, whether it's anxiety attacks, panic attacks, pencil tapping, shoe tapping. It depends on person to person. Yes, thank you all so much again um, for those insights. And I think it's such an important point that was brought up that there isn't really one type of way that stress and anxiety looks even within you know, certain communities, it's, it really depends, you know, some people in communities might have a bicultural identity, some might not, you know, depending on the extent of stigma in communities and things as well. And we will definitely be moving on to talk a little bit about stigma later on. But I also want to say that I think it's no surprise that in the question regarding community, um, COVID was brought up because, you know, we as a whole community have been severely affected by COVID and, you know, so, 
are as well um, currently. So um, following up from that, I want to ask, um, you know, what are some anticipated or perhaps already occurring feelings of stress and anxiety that might be brought about by returning to things like workplaces, social activities and things like that, you know, in post and in the midst of this pandemic? I think one of the, you know, when you were saying that wouldn't, you know, everyone's returning to a social setting, um, you know, if you've noticed, if you've been away for something for so long, it builds that anticipation of not wanting to go back, right? Like, the, I don't know why this is just coming in my head because we're talking about high school, but in high school, people like skipping one class, two classes, three classes, because it just gets so hard to go back. And I think with returning to this new world or this, you know, the new normal I think the anxiety is going to be there because there's a lot of relationships that people were happy not seeing. Like, you know, if they got bullied by someone, if they got made fun of, or if they had to play a role, they probably were happy not being in the presence of these people. But now going back and they haven't experienced those negative emotions or those feelings, it's going to build that anxiety. And I think on the, on the flip side, if you've grown to a new person, you've developed uh, a lot, you're going to have that uh, almost imposter syndrome. And I'll, I'll share a personal example. The last two years I've done a lot of development and there were family members that I recently saw and I was a whole new person. But then when I was in the presence of them, it's kind of like the old me came back and was like, okay, can I do this? Can I really live up to my boundaries, my standards and be the real me? And I, I think it's okay to realize that it will be a little uncomfortable. It will be a little challenging, but it, it's just one of those things where you kind of got to work through um, and I'll let everyone else share how we can how we can give some solutions and recommendations on how to do that. I do agree with a lot of what Sunny was saying, and it's actually even touching to what Gloria said, actually, about that feeling of social anxiety and kind of performing in these settings. I do know that's come up quite a lot as well in the work that I've done, and the anxiety comes from being in close proximity again to others as well, whether they're colleagues or family or friends, managing that schedule that looks so different, like Sunny said as well, we had a chance to almost rework how we lived our lives. We might have nurtured other interests, we might have developed our personalities, and I know for people, especially with children, it's now thinking about, okay, how does that schedule look like again? with childcare, or how does this new normal, as you rightfully said, that's the term that frequently comes up, what does this look like? And the key thing here as well, that a lot of people I'm working with are saying, irrespective of culture, is about boundary setting, essentially knowing, okay, what am I able to do, or what am I not comfortable to do? What social activities am I comfortable saying yes or no to? I know being from a South Asian community, we say yes to everything. We say yes to the neighbors, garden party, wedding, I don't know, somebody opened a fridge. We do everything. But at this time, I think it's helped us to stop and acknowledge, okay, what is my personal threshold? What am I feeling inside of myself? Of course, there's regulations and policies, and that may vary from wherever we all live. Um, however, in the UK, for example, the majority of our pandemic restrictions have been removed. So that for my clients are now working through a working plan of how are they going to manage this transitionary period, kind of the person who they were pre-pandemic to who they are now. And so again, that means having that self-compassion and empathy comes into it because you're recognizing, okay, what I was like maybe in 2020 pre-pandemic isn't necessarily working for me now in 2021. So again, it's people questioning about what they're compelled to say yes to just for the sake of it and how they want to authentically show up is what Gloria touched on as well. Yeah, the, the, the boundaries is, is such a big piece. And it's interesting hearing about uh, in the UK. So I, I'm in Toronto, and we've only just, you know, recently started opening things up again. And it's funny that this question comes up because I finally went to um, the movies for the first time uh, a few weeks ago. And I was shocked at how overwhelmed I was 
just sensory wise, um, I don't remember movies ever being quite that loud. And I, I felt a reaction to just being around all these crowds and the noises and the color. And it made me wonder how we even lived before. <laughs> so if, if I were to give any advice, um, I would say that it's okay to take your time to settle back into whatever normal life looks like, because I couldn't even be out for two hours, to be completely honest. We have adapted to having a quieter environment, seeing fewer people. And so it's going to take uh, a transition to, you know, and slowly building our way up uh, to this new normal again. Yeah, that's my two cents. Um, I would say when COVID started, it was very difficult for high school students to navigate through, you know, it's an entire new system, you test online, like the AP tests were online, which are a huge deal for high schoolers, and you have to, like, mold into this new world, whereas technology, you don't get to see your friends, it's very different, you're worried about your grandparents, what exactly COVID is, because there wasn't much information at that time, and then suddenly, you're going back to the new normal when you are finally adapted to the technology world. And then you go to school and they're like, yeah, you can't use technology anymore. And it's like entire new world again. So it's hard to cope with that as well. Like just being used to a normal life for personally, like it's hard for me to like, you know, get into a schedule, like wake up, go to this time to bed, these classes as Sunny mentioned earlier, like it's hard for you to change this quickly and adapt that quickly. Yeah, absolutely. I think the underlying thing from what all of you, all of you lot were saying is it's it's going to be a process for everybody um, to kind of, you know, re reintegrate into society, essentially. Um, and something that really stuck out to me is something you said, Amrit Paul, a phrase, um, personal threshold. Um, just personally speaking, a lot of the times when I hear about boundaries, I think about, oh, my boundaries with other people and less so about, you know, my boundaries with myself. And often we'll stress and stress and stress and we'll be like, but I just have to do it. But I think something that this time might have taught us is that we can pause and we can take a second as well. Um, so now I want to move on to, I think, you know, something that is going to be really beneficial to hear from all of all of you panelists about, and that is some key routines or practices that we can incorporate into our daily lives to reduce feelings of stress and anxiety. A lot of the, pers the things I personally do and I recommend my clients do is just, um, and it's going to depend, so I'm, I'm just generally speaking, um, is just sit with, uh, sit with your thoughts, sit, sit with your emotions, you know, make sure you're in a safe space. You know, if you don't have the, if you don't have that luxury to do it at home because there's other people around or you have kids, uh, you know, go drive, go for a drive, just in the car, ask yourself how you're feeling. Uh, meditation is something that's really good too. Uh, for the longest time, I, I avoided it. Um, I just like, I don't need it, but it's, it's an amazing thing to do. So meditate, just sit with your thoughts and figure out what's going on. And then the things that you're, you know, you might be stressing about, ask yourself, is this something I can control? Is this something I cannot control? Is this something that involves two people? You know, for example, maybe I have, a, I have resentment towards someone. Okay. Maybe I need to go talk to a person or, you know, my, the job that I'm in, it's not good. I'm really stressed out. What can I do to change it? So always focus on what you can control. Cause I feel like when you feel more in control of the situations, it, it can reduce that stress and anxiety to some extent. I would say obviously there's a combination of things that we can all try and I agree with Sunny, like there's a variety of things. It's almost like trial and testing sometimes. I know, for example, I have even as, as well used meditation. I know that people use mindfulness so getting very aware of what's in their surrounding environment, what they're touching, what they can feel, what they can see, what links to that as well has been breath work. So getting very intentional about how you're breathing, breathing from your stomach, maybe even counting down from 10 to one because you're disrupting your regular way of thinking just in that moment if you can. In terms of obviously 
having a set, I guess, routine or a structure. I think we can get into that a little bit later, but I know sometimes people feel they need something in place, whether it's even like a 30 minute walk or their form of exercise to kind of cope. It's having something in place that almost anchors you, whether that's listening to a podcast for 20 minutes, reading a chapter of like your favorite book. I know even some people have explained to me drawing or sketching brings them a sense of calm. It's necessarily you tuning into the activity that makes you feel that sense of relief. And sometimes obviously that does mean taking stock afterwards. We can obviously go into more self-reflective questions, but in the moment when you're feeling very anxious, you may actually need more of an activity because your thoughts may be jumbled up in the key moment when you're having a severe either anxiety attack or a panic attack. So again, it's being conscious of, okay, where you're at in that moment. Yes, and just uh, picking back, back of, piggybacking off of what you just said, uh, I don't necessarily believe that um, everyone should have just one routine because in that case, you're sort of following a formula and you're not really exercising the muscle of actually listening to your body and listening to what you need in that moment. So for example, on different days, you may wake up and your body needs something completely different. Uh, some days, if you feel more energetic, self-care might look like, you know, going for a walk and other days it might feel like, um, uh, you know, settling down, doing doing some meditation. So uh, I guess my, my advice would just be to just start off asking yourself uh, what you need. Um, for coping with stress and anxiety, I think it depends on person to person on what they love. For some, for instance, I like running to reduce my stress. Someone might like dancing. Some people like to listen to music, meditating, yoga, you know, it kind of depends on what you like. Maybe you want to like write down your thoughts in a diary. So it depends on what you want to do with your time and how, what things help you reduce that stress and just go with it. Yes, thank you. Thank you all so much for sharing those. Those are all, you know, really helpful. Um, and I really like, um, you know, the, the comments that both Gurit and Gloria, you, you made about, um, you know, kind of just going with the flow and listening to your body as well. Um, and so now I want to, we want to talk a little bit about um, shame and stigma. And, you know, a lot of these coping mechanisms as well might already exist in some of our communities, but there's still that stigma of, you know, we do these coping mechanisms, but nothing's really wrong or, you know, and things like that. So just to talk a little bit about, um, how can we collectively and actively challenge stigmas, you know, whether these be cultural stigma, age stigma, gender-based stigmas, and towards mental health struggles? I think one of the biggest uh, stigmas, and especially in the South Asian community, is um, for men in particular that they need to be strong, they need to be dominant, they need to be alpha males, and that doesn't consist of them crying, them showing emotion. Um, and in my experience and working with the, my clients that I've had, one of the biggest obstacles is obviously the stigma in that, but they don't really have people to go to or the people they've gone through, gone to have made fun of them or said, you know, man it up, tough it up, or, you know, multiple other swear words to them because they, they're just like, you know, you, you have to be a man, you have to do this. And then they kind of shut off on their own. And then they, you know, they, it, they, they turn violent, they have random outbursts because they have, they're holding so many emotions in and it just it comes out in the wrong way. So I think, um, you know, it, it could be even men, females, anyone really, I think in any community is your family, unfortunately, and your friends might not always be the right people to talk to. And I, I know when I say that, a lot of people don't like that statement, but, you know, the best example I like to use is, you know, you wouldn't go to, to your dad to play, like if you could go, if you wanted to learn how to play basketball, would you go to your dad or would you go to LeBron James, right? Your dad is your family, yeah. But LeBron James is one of the best basketball players, right? So 
sometimes it's okay to look out of our immediate circle for that help, for that guidance, right? And that's uh, that's something I do. Like I've, I've mentors that are not my friends, they're not my family, but but they really support me. And, and that's what I always tell my clients that the help is out there. Like this is a perfect example of it. You know, there's so many pe- good people on social media. There's uh, counselors, there's, there's so many different services. Like if you look at the right place, the help is out there. Sometimes it might be within your family, in your friend circle, but sometimes it won't be. And I think the matter panelists can elaborate on that when you, when you need that really, we need that professional help. You need to go to, you know, you got to take it to the next level and go to someone else. But in the beginning, you just got to look outside your circle and really talk to people that will support you and listen to understand, not just to judge and say, um, one of the other common things I get is uh, I'll have clients go to, you know, their cousins or friends and say, I, I went through this breakup. And one of my clients told me that his cousin said, it's okay. I went through a breakup too. It's, it was a year longer than yours and I'm okay. You'll be okay too. And that's just, you're basically walking over how that person felt, right? So make sure you you look outside your family and friends because sometimes they won't be able to help you out. There is a lot of truth to that actually. It's not only going to someone you trust, but also somebody who can truly sit with you in whatever it is that you're acknowledging. That is so key, irrespective of whatever title they have. I think the shame or stigma comes into it when we start to think about what will other people think or how will others perceive us. Um, I do think with shame, what happens is we feel that we need to remain silent Uh, about an issue that is concerning us but actually that's almost like a double-edged sword because that makes it actually grow that increases the feelings of isolation when we stay silent because we buy into the notion of it's just me and the reality is it's not and that's not to dismiss anybody's pain it was interesting Sonny giving that example of a friend saying well this happened to me I think sometimes we try to quantify or have a barometer uh, for suffering when suffering is just suffering as they say it doesn't have to look the same for somebody else it's like Gloria said a group that you you look at what's happening for you your sensations and you're in tune what's going on in your body and I do think being from a South Asian culture and this can happen across other cultures that I've worked with as well that ethos or stance of we just get on with it like just stay busy just just carry on. But the reality is the symptoms of anxiety and stress, they can be very real. Physiologically, they can really bring you to a standstill in terms of how your breathing is. You can perspire, you can feel like you can't even move. I've had clients actually be in that freeze mode. So again, it is having these conversations like we are to acknowledge even that there is an issue and there are understandably gaps I do see that as well in therapy work men do as well irrespective of culture they do get left behind and I guess that comes into that talk about masculinity how men feel they should be perceived how they should have all the solutions when actually you may need somebody to walk beside you offer you a framework or at least a holding space if nothing else I think sometimes we need to be heard and valued in order for us to even begin to acknowledge okay this is what's hurting or this is where I'm at right now yes everything you all said is just on the ball around gender and uh, in the Asian community Um, You know, I was thinking about this the other day and something, one of the the stigmas that seems to come up is this idea that if you go to therapy, it means that there's something wrong with you, which of course will clear the air on that one. That's absolutely uh, not true at all. And the point of getting help for for your mental health isn't even to to fix you, right? That's, That's not something anyone can do, but it's helping you see things from a different perspective and helping you help yourself work through situations. Um, And so, yeah, I I really hope that with events just like this one, we can help shift 
our perspectives on mental health and we that, that we can see mental health just as normal as going to the doctor for a checkup, right? Or going to the dentist, it, it really is no difference. Um, I feel to acknowledge, first of all, it's very hard to high schoolers to you because since they're minors to get outside help. But I think for, uh, for the stigma, it's a lot of for high schoolers, like parents, even they know their stress, they just don't wanna acknowledge it and talk to them about their stress. So I think one of the number one steps would be like for the kid to talk to their parents and, you know, convey their feelings, what they're truly feeling at the moment and asking for help. If not, like there are other technology, like as Sunny mentioned, you can, you know, a lot of great Instagram pages, you can look around a lot of, you know, help to get around, if not like friends and also like a lot of schools do have counseling. You can like, you know, go talk to the school. I mean, it does take time to get there, but there's definitely a thing for everyone from how they can like convey, convey their feelings to others and cope with their stress, I would say. Thank you, everyone. Um, thanks. And so I think that, you know, stigma and shame is such a, is such a, it's such a big part and, you know, a big deterrence often from seeking help, you know, along with things like access and, um, you know, finances and affordable therapy and things like that. And I just, you know, this might be a bit of a difficult question and maybe even unanswerable really, but I do want to throw out there if any of you panelists want to answer this is, you know, what, um, what might you do if, um, what could one do if they were faced with, um, you know, a family member or a friend um, or just anyone in their community who they trusted um, who really wasn't able to give them the help that they need? What might you advise them to do? I, I, I can answer that. I, I think, yeah, it's definitely tricky to answer. Um, you know, help them out as much as you can. Uh, understand their resistance in getting that help and kind of dig into that deeper. What's the resistance? And is it shame? Is it stigma? What's really going on? And offer resources. But I do think there also is, if you do too much, it, it's almost as an opposite effect. So you got to be really, really careful. Um, it's, it's one of those things, again, it's going to depend on situation to situation. But I think when it comes down to it, the individual themselves has to have some level of willingness to want to get that help, want to get that change. So it, it, it's it's definitely tough, like I said, because you don't want to put the burden on yourself too much, but at the same time, you want to help them. So that's why I'm saying it depends situation to situation. But the key ingredient that is going to be needed is they have to have some kind of willingness to get some level of help. I do agree with that. It's almost like therapy isn't done to somebody or somebody doesn't just get pushed a certain number because again, there's that willingness of consent and ownership and also feeling, okay, I'm doing this for myself. And in terms of obviously, I'm trying to understand Sasha, what you meant by, is it that the person isn't getting supported to get help or they're reluctant to get help? Um, I guess both really, I guess both could, um, could be um, a situation. So if you could answer to both, that would, that would be great. Okay, if somebody's reluctant to get help initially, obviously if they're reluctant to get help, they may have not even discussed it with anybody. If there is anybody listening to this and you're at that stage, it doesn't have to be all or nothing. At the end of this, resources are gonna be provided. There's helplines that are confidential. So you don't even have to give your name or specifics. Just see that as a first starting point and see how you feel with that. In terms of obviously, if you have people around you who aren't supportive about you getting help, of course, there's no denying that I have had clients and other people come to me and that's a very painful experience initially. But it's like even Gloria said, it's you're looking at it as much as, okay, if you were bleeding somewhere physically, you would think to yourself, I need emergency assistance. 
I need to either go to the hospital or I need to go see a doctor, but we can dismiss our mental health because we can't see it. But it's almost like something bleeding on the inside. And what is a shame is that obviously, understandably, I do not take away from someone's reservations or fears, but what happens is people come to the point of crisis right at the end before they go for an intervention. So I'm hoping this webinar and this conversation allows somebody to think, actually, let me take some preventative or initial measures rather than waiting until it's really severe and then really struggling to even ask for help then. It is normalizing, even reaching out for help. It's okay. The reality is, if I look at all, I get sort of personal journals that give information, like the stats, for example, following the pandemic, was every five out of 10 people in the US and the UK are now saying that they're suffering from anxiety, whereas that was every one out of 10 in 2019. So there has been a jump. It's not anxiety, isn't stress, isn't something that happens out there to other people. It can happen to any of us at any single point, irrespective of social status, gender, sexuality. That doesn't stand in the face of having these feelings and these emotions. I think it's normalizing that as well. I think the first question got answered very well. I have nothing to add. <laughs> um, but for Sasha, your second question, I will also say that sometimes it can take a few tries before you find the right fit of someone to work with. And that's, it's very normal. Um, and so, you know, for those who are perhaps looking for a counselor or therapist or a psychologist, um, a lot of people do offer a free consultation. I do, I do recommend, uh, you know, exploring your options and making sure that you actually feel comfortable talking to the person and sometimes it's just not a right fit and it's not your fault or that person's fault sometimes you're just not vibing with the person that's the best way I can describe it um, and that's completely okay and it's it's okay to um, take your time to find someone that that you want to work with I think that's what you asked I'm not sure <laughs> Yeah, I think two really, um, you know, two really great takeaways from this conversation we've had about shame and stigma is one on a personal level, you know, kind of getting to that point of having, you know, one, the, the will to get help and two, also being in a place where you feel comfortable to be vulnerable enough to get help. And then another takeaway is, you know, the importance of somebody who you maybe care about or you love and who is in a, you know, in a state of anxiety or high stress is just, you know, not really telling them this is what you should do, this is the fix, but more so, you know, sitting in the trenches with them. And um, Gloria, I really like that you brought up, um, you know, the good point about um, finding a therapist and having, you know, those available to you. And I'd like to segue that into our next question about what are some resources that already exist within our communities that we can utilize to heal? I, I think, uh, as I was saying, uh, events like this, I personally do a lot of I, IG lives talking about different topics, uh, mental health, uh, stig stigma, so a lot of stuff within the South Asian community, I, and I have a lot of different South Asian guests talking about our personal experiences, so that's a resource as well. Um, you know, any one of us, I'm sure, would be like, to, could help out. And, you know, as an HR professional, the other thing is, depending on the, the countries, there's also employee assistant programs. Um, I, I don't know what it's like in the UK or um, I, I'm in I'm in Vancouver, so I, I would assume Toronto is the same, Gloria, um, but employee, employee assistance programs, they're anonymous. So the way it works is the company pays, you know, X amount and the company will only know the number of employees that use it and not the employee's name. So that's confidential and a lot of them have numbers like just, you know, hotlines that you can call and talk about honestly anything. So I would use a lot, utilize that resource if you have a job and you work for a company, that's a really good one. And again, just a lot of Instagram pages. There's a, there's a lot of good groups out there. There's, there's so many right now that I can't name, but the, like I was saying before, 
there's a lot of help on social media. Yeah, as much as social media does have its downfalls, there's also a lot of good if you're, if you're willing to look for it. Yes, uh, add to that. Obviously, I can speak in line with the UK. Obviously, Gloria may be able to give more about therapist directories there. We have obviously the BACP or the UKIP, which you can search for registered therapists. Again, rightfully, Gloria said that you can have a free consultation to see how you feel your level of comfortability. There are also helplines, which I know will be shared at the end on the slide. In the UK here as well as like the Seek Helpline, we also have Mind, the Samaritans, and I even do work for a nonprofit called Seek Forgiveness, where again, having these kind of conversations, things that where there is certain, dare I say, taboos or stigmas or conversations that people are reluctant to have. I know that the fact of with university students that I've worked with, usually there are help centers, online counseling services there. So I guess in whatever remit you are, this is, I guess, the benefit of search engines and social media that sometimes does get flagged, but if you do that search, you can get those. Because again, we have to be realistic. Sometimes everybody's finances and situation does look different. Some people can't afford private therapy. Sometimes here we have the National Health Service, yes, there's GPs, there's a waiting list. So sometimes helplines are your easiest resource, depending on where you're at. So I never want to just say there's one way of getting help for somebody, because I appreciate everyone's personal circumstances who's listening to this webinar may vary according to that. Yes, and speaking of affordable resources, um, I'm, I'm thinking of there are some apps that you can download for free for meditation, like Headspace, or actually I think you have to pay, pay for um, past the trial use of that one, but Calm is free. Um, it's just a quick Google search. They have developed a lot of free apps for anxiety, uh, depression, and managing symptoms. Um, free podcasts like this one up here. Uh, there are free YouTube videos. Um, yeah, Google is really your friend for this one. Um, I feel there are a lot of like resources, as you all mentioned, like spot on, a um, lot of helplines, even for teenagers, if you just search uh, like teen helpline, there's specific um, helplines just for teenagers um, through what to explain, like help them with what they experience. There are a lot of, as you guys mentioned, a lot of social medias. There are like a lot of social medias I can think on top of my head, just dedicated to teen mental health and even like school counseling. And if um, even if you go to the your local district school website, there is usually a mental health portion where they give you resources from which you can get help or you can, you know, reach out to the school to get that help you need. Absolutely. Thank you all so much for sharing all of that. That's really helpful. Um, and I want to apologize to our audience. We have gone a little past the time that we were supposed to for the Q&A, but let's get into that now. So um, let's see, one of the questions we have here. So um, quick question, just like Gloria said, during COVID anxiety and stress levels have increased in people. So what can be the initial simple techniques to relax and feel comfortable? And this is open to any and all panelists to answer. Um, I would say there are a lot of simple techniques like I know a couple of people that like to crochet and think about their day and think what they have been through or like knitting you can like go do a workout and think about it uh, meditation music yoga there's so many techniques out there it just depends on what you like to do and how you want to cope with it. I'd like to add if somebody needs to obviously there's journaling as well free journaling to kind of explain that it's actually based on the work of James Pennebaker and that's where they found that if people have emotionally charged moments in their lives whatever they may be resulting to you can see improvement in mental health and physical health if you take even 20 minutes to just 
write whatever comes into your mind or head without any kind of judgment. It doesn't have to be every single day. It can even have an effect three times a week. You can record your voice or you can write or you can type. It's just in that moment, if you feel quite overwhelmed with certain thoughts and emotions, it helps you release that safely. Just in case if you're not around anybody and you want to have that sense of, I guess, acknowledgement, that can help as well. Thank you. Thank you both for your answers. Um, we're just going to share as well um, a resources slide now as well. So please feel free to take pictures of this um, slide, screenshots, whatever you may please. Okay, just waiting on some questions coming in. So we have a question here asking um, some, what coping skills um, maybe have stuck out to you in particular that you may personally implement in your lives? Um, the personal things I do is a lot of, um, I like running. So I just like to listen to music while I'm on my run and try to think throughout the stress and the anxiety I have throughout the day, whether it's testing or presentation the next day. So it's just like taking, rather than working through it, just taking a little time off and trying a technique that personally helps you, like for me instead of running, and then coming back to it really helps me. I thought I'd sort of piggyback off that. Even for me, physical activity as well really helps me to cope. Definitely this last year and a half, even if it meant I was walking or because sometimes the gyms were closed, I think getting out in an open space can help you feel more grounded and more centered. But to kind of refer back to what both Gloria and Arif had said, is also looking what my body needs. I've become better at that. So if I it even means like an Epsom salt bath, so be it. There's not a kind of prescribed method. It's actually really tuning in to, okay, this is what I'm experiencing. Okay, what do I need? Sometimes let's say for what it is, even if it's a nap, you might need just a 30 minute, just time out. Sometimes it can feel so overwhelming. So I think again, it's taking some of these things that we've spoken about today and almost having like this toolbox, that's how I see it. I've got that too, everything that the panelists have mentioned. If I feel on a given day, that's what I need. I might pick some of that. It's like even meditation, I have, um, what's called the insight timer. And I just find them so calming because there's spoken word meditations. So I just relax with that. It's such soothing music and words and some of them are directed towards anxiety and stress. So if you need something else to follow or you have difficulty sleeping, that really does actually work. So it's worth trying that as well. I love Epsom salt baths too. <laughs> They're really relaxing. Um, me personally, I like doing uh, more of the reflective things at nighttime because it puts me to sleep. So it's not really the, the best way for me to start off my day. Um, I like to start off the day with um, you know, moving my body, just like um, you guys here, uh, you know, doing some exercise and then using more mindfulness to unwind at the end of the day. To add to every what everyone has said, I think another one uh, that's worked for me, and I'm still resistant to it at times, but I do have good people around me that probe me and can figure out what's going on. But just talking about it, honestly, just putting it out there 
and saying, you know, I'm scared. I, I'm, I'm stressed out. It actually, it, it feels really good inside. It's like some physical, it's got a better physical feeling, but then it's, it's also kind of like you, you know, you see the monster in the dark and you turn the light on and you realize the monster's not as intimidating as you thought it was. Thank you all so much um, for sharing again. And um, we're almost close to the end, but I'd like to wrap it up with this question because I think it's you know really timely with everything that's going on as well. And so the question is um, also, um, the, um, this person says that they love what everybody was saying about the importance of boundaries. And do you have any tips on how to communicate boundaries when that's something that typically, typically causes stress and anxiety? I can yeah I can yeah, I can talk about that and that's that's actually one of like the main things that I offer in my coaching program is building those boundaries is uh it really comes down to what your you know what your values are why you feel a certain way right so if you if you feel that someone treats you, someone's really disrespectful to you talking about it for a first time is going to be probably difficult but you also got to look at you got to kind of look future project and look at what will happen if I don't have this conversation, what will happen if I don't stand up for myself. Right. And I think if you're, if you're talking to someone for the first time where you've never stood up to them before, they're almost going to get offended that you're standing up for yourself. Um, and just know that sometimes it's okay. Like it's going to be uncomfortable. It's, it's going to feel a little, little difficult because it's almost like you're, you're going out of your comfort zone, but you're also, you're standing up for yourself you're building those boundaries so i mean the easiest way is the actual conversation itself i always say is you don't have to be confrontational you don't have to swear or yell at them you just say approach it from the side of this is instead of saying you know i don't like how you disrespect me or you know you're a rude person you're you know you're, you're a jerk instead say what you've what you've been doing or what you have been saying this is how it makes me feel and then it puts that person in that uh, it, it takes kind of their guard off. Sunny, you were really spot on with that. I, I saw a quote the other day that says, if someone reacts really badly to you setting your boundaries, it means that they were benefiting from your lack of boundaries in the first place. And if that's the case, I would really question what that friendship or that relationship is based on in the first place right if you can't if you don't even feel like it's safe uh, within that friendship to communicate these things i completely agree with what both of the panelists said there and it is very much i feel when it's also just acknowledging again what is going on for you. I know that one of the boundaries that actually has been coming a lot, a lot for clients are declining events or declining invitations. So a key thing that sometimes people are now saying is, thank you for thinking of me. However, I will not be able to attend. Usually sometimes we think that a boundary, we need to give a justification. You don't. Obviously, you're right, like Sunny said, there is going to be a pushback at times because sometimes people are used to you showing up a certain way or they perceive you to want to play a certain role and it is going to feel uncomfortable, but at times you can just be used to having a short statement or a sentence, even if you have to write it down in front of you, you know, take some baby steps because it can feel a real jump depending on the dynamic that you have in place with a particular person. But it is standing sort of firm in that boundary. It may mean you reinstating a certain boundary that is actually not an attack on the other person, but it's you respecting and working in line with what feels authentic and true to you. Oh, thank you so much. I think we can leave the audience with those final remarks. Thank you all so, so much for joining us today. Thank you to our panelists, Amrit Paul, Sunny, Gloria, Garit. Thank you to Amrit Paul and our Khalsa Aid team who worked behind the scenes to ensure today's webinar went smoothly. We hope that this conversation was beneficial, informative and enjoyable for you. And stay tuned for our upcoming mental health webinars. Um, as we come to an end for today, we're going to just put the resources slide up again on the screen. And if you didn't get to take a picture or anything, you can do so now. You can also email admin.usa at calsaaid.org for a copy. 
um, and take care, everybody. Thank you so much for joining. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Take care.